afternoon. I will speak on the international campaign to seek rights and redress for Jews from Arab countries. Over the past 75 years, the Arab-Israeli conflict has dominated Middle East affairs. Long-standing deep-seated convictions and animosities exist on both sides that have polarized nations and peoples around the world. The ultimate and inevitable victims of these years of strife are the people of the region, the hundreds of thousands who were uprooted from their homes and displaced. Two populations of refugees emerged from this conflict, Arabs from mandated Palestine and Jews from Arab countries. Both Jews recognized as bona fide refugees by the relevant UN agencies. Yet when the issue of refugees is raised within the context of the Middle East, the international community invariably refers only to Palestinian refugees, never to Jews from Arab countries. That is why the Knesset of Israel on June 23, 2014, adopted the law which designated November the 30th as an annual day of commemoration to mark the exile of Jews from Arab countries in Iran. And here I would like to single out the contribution of Haver Knesset at the time, Shimon Ohayon, who was instrumental in getting this resolution adopted. Now, it must be stated that there is some justification for the international community's continuing focus on Palestinian refugees. We know that emanating as a result of the 1948 conflict in the Middle East, Palestinians are considered the world's largest and longest standing refugee population who still require significant international services and financial assistance. But their continuing needs do not supersede the fact that Palestinians were not the only <coughs> Middle East refugees. Now, there is no parallel history nor demography that could allow for any just comparison between the fate of Palestinian refugees and the plight of Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Moreover, there is one fundamental distinction between the two, as alluded to by Mr. Gabay earlier. The newly established State of Israel, under attack from six Arab armies, with scant and scarce resources, opened its doors to hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees displaced from Arab countries, granted them citizenship, and tried under very difficult circumstances to absorb them into Israeli society. By contrast, the Arab world, with the exception of Jordan, turned their backs on displaced Arabs from mandated Palestine, sequestering them into refugee camps to be used as a political weapon against the state of Israel for these past over 70 years. So while there is no symmetry between these two narratives, there is one important factor that applies to both, namely the moral imperative to ensure that all bona fide refugees receive equal treatment under international law. Now, the Arab world's position on Jewish refugees from Arab countries was clear, what I call the four no's. One, no, there were no large Jewish populations of Jews displaced from Arab countries. Two, no. There was no discrimination against Jews in Arab countries. Three, no, there was no expulsion of Jews. They all left of their own free will. And four, no, no Jews left behind extensive assets, so they don't deserve any compensation. So when J Justice for Jews from Arab countries first raised this issue with senior officials of the US State Department, we were met with skepticism. They challenged the notion that there were Jewish refugees from Arab countries. They asked two fundamental questions. Number one, were they really refugees? They had a place to go. And under the international definition of refugees, if you have a place, a country to flee, you are no other refugees. So the, according to the State Department, there were no Jewish refugees. And secondly, even assuming that they were refugees at that time, what makes you think that there was any rights that these refugees still possess 70 years after the fact when they're no longer refugees? Two very good questions which we did not have answers to at the time. So we undertook legal research two years under the stewardship of the Honorable Erwin Cutler, former Justice Minister of Canada, and these two questions were answered. Were Jews displaced from Arab countries really refugees? The answer is yes. We see here that on two occasions, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees determined the Jews fleeing Arab countries were indeed refugees under the mandate of the UNHCR. The first time, was in 1957, relating to Jews fleeing from Egypt, and the second time was in 1967, in reference to Jews fleeing from North African countries. As to the second question, 
Even if Jews fleeing Arab countries were refugees, do they still have rights today? Once again, the answer is yes, because there is no statute of limitations on the rights of refugees. The passage of time does not negate refugee rights to seek redress for human rights violations as well as for personal losses. If a refugee left behind assets, bank accounts, pension plans, they do not lose their rights to these assets, notwithstanding how many years have passed. So under international law, Jews displaced from Arab countries were refugees and still possess rights today. So legally, the case is clear. History is also clear. The past century saw the massive displacement of Jews from Arab countries. In 1948, there were 856,000 Jews resident in some 10 Arab countries. In, 19, in 2018, it is estimated that only 4,185 Jews remain. And you will notice here that large exoduses occurred during and before and after major Arab-Israeli wars, 1948, War of 1956, War of 1967, War of 1973. And from 1947 into well into the 1970s, on numerous occasions, governmental and non-governmental officials, Israelis, US, and others, Poland as an example, alerted the United Nations to the problem of Jewish refugees and sought its intervention to no avail. And there were startling differences in the differential treatment by the United Nations in favor of Arab refugees as opposed to Jewish refugees. With respect to resolutions, Resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly totaled 1,258 up until 2018. Fully 205 of those resolutions dealt only and singularly with Palestinian refugees. We see also ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, the UN Human Rights Council. Although UN Resolution 242 refers generically to a just solution of the refugee problem, which includes Palestinian refuge, uh, Jewish refugees, there is not one, there never has been one UN resolution of any body that has ever specifically referred to Jewish refugees from Arab countries. But the UN moved well beyond mere resolutions and declarations. With respect to UN agencies, the UN mandated or created 10 separate agencies to address the rights of Palestinian refugees. There were no agencies correct there were no agencies crafted, created by the UN to deal with the rights and plight of Jewish refugees. With respect to UN resources, the international community through UNRWA and other UN agencies has spent tens of billions of dollars for the care and welfare of Palestinian refugees. We did the research. No funds were ever forthcoming, even from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, for the rescue and rehabilitation of Jewish refugees from Arab countries. During the 1960s and 70s, the Government of Israel and the World Organization of Jews from Arab Countries, WOJAK, along with other Sephardic groups, tried to keep this issue alive. But by the year 2000, neither Israel nor any major Jewish organization had this issue on their active political agenda. And that is what led to the founding of Justice for Jews from Arab Countries in the year 2002, first launched at the United Nations in the presence of ambassadors Yehud Halankri of Israel, and Richard Holbrook of the United States. As a coalition of Jewish communal organizations, JJAC was founded by the Conference of Presidents, the World Jewish Congress, WOJAC, and the American Sephardi Federation. Through their efforts and those of other groups like Jimena, Harif, and innumerable others, there have been some modest, intermittent achievements. Recognition by US political leaders of Jewish refugees has enhanced the credibility and strengthen the legitimacy of our claims for rights and redress. US President Jimmy Carter, after successfully brokering the Camp David Accords and the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty stated in a press conference on October 27, 1977, quote, Palestinians have rights. Obviously, there are Jewish refugees. They have the same rights as others do. Of course, former President Bill Clinton made the following assertion after the rights of Jews for refugees were discussed at Camp David II in July of 2000. There will have to be some sort of international fund set up for refugees, fund which compensates the Israelis who were made refugees by the war, because Israel is full of people, Jewish people, 
who lived in predominantly Arab countries who came to Israel because they were made refugees in their own lands. Recognition by political leaders is important, and it goes just beyond the United States. We see here Canadian Prime Minister recognized, Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin recognized Jewish refugees in a June 3rd, 205 interview. A refugee is a refugee, and the situation of Jewish refugees from Arab countries must be recognized. British Prime Minister Theresa May spoke at a dinner in London marking the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration on November 2nd, 2017. We must recognize how difficult this journey has been from the Jews forced out of their homes in Arab countries to the suffering of Palestinians affected by dislodged by Israel's birth, such as the even-handedness of the United Kingdom. Beyond public statements, a number of national legislatures have recognized Jewish refugees from Arab countries. In the United States, House Resolution 185 was unanimously adopted by the U.S. Congress on April 1, 2008. It states, inter alia, that the House urges the President and U.S. officials participating in Middle East negotiations to ensure, quote, that any explicit reference to Palestinian refugees is matched by a similar explicit reference to Jewish and other refugees as a matter of law and equity. The Canadian cabinet went as long as well. On March 5, 2014, the Canadian cabinet and parliament, quote, officially recognized the experience of Jewish refugees who were expelled from states in the Middle East and North Africa after 1948. And of course, the Knesset of Israel has adopted two bills in 2008 and 2010 confirming rights including compensation for Jews displaced from Arab countries, and that these rights must be addressed in any Middle East peace negotiations. Such now is the policy of the government of Israel. <coughs> now, in the face of these positive recognitions, we came to the realization that, unfortunately, our community was not fully prepared to negotiate for rights and redress on Jewish refugees, including compensation. In conducting our research, we discovered that there were few records on actual losses and that there was not adequate nor proper documentation to support any of our claims for compensation. Now, I must state that Palestinians have done their homework. We see here 11 studies of losses claimed by Palestinian refugees from quasi-governmental sources like the United Nations Com Conciliation Commission for Palestine, to less formal academic studies. Many are based on precise records of the British protectorate in Palestine provided to the Palestinians by the United Kingdom. The latest and most comprehensive report was produced in 2008 by Thierry Senecal at the request of the Negotiations Affairs Department of the Palestinian Authority. As you see, the last one on the chart, it claims losses totaling 3,393,363,782 in 1948 US dollars. In today's figures, if you factor in exchange rates, inflation and interest, that would translate into 159 billion, 155 million, 367,753 dollars and 17 cents. Quite a staggering figure. Now, this is what we face. By comparison, there have been few, I would say modest, efforts to research Jewish assets lost. In 2007, the World Organization of Jews from Arab countries estimated that Jews and Jewish communities left behind, quote, assets valued today at more than $300 billion in 2007 prices. Ben Yamini alluded to the properties. Most of these properties were located in Iraq, Egypt, and Morocco. These were referred to by Wojak. The most recent study on lost assets was conducted by Sidney Zabludal, an international economist who worked on economic figures at the CIA, the White House, and the tre Treasury. From his analysis of the limited number of records available, in 207 prices, losses was a total $6 billion. This, though, however, does not include any communal property. There are also two books on Jewish refugees' losses, which cover a few countries, but in reality, there has never been a comprehensive professional audit of individual or communal losses 
suffered by Jews and Jewish communities displaced from Arab countries. We did not do our homework. So to address this channel, this challenge, for the past three years, JJEC has been working with an international forensic accounting firm to produce 11 country reports on these individual and communal losses in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Aden, as well as Iran. These financial projections in these reports reflect the first attempt in a systematic and comprehensive way to compile a record of financial losses of all Jews from Arab countries. The compilation of this data has been hampered by the fact that these events occurred more than 75 years ago, and there is no one central repository where records of these losses were maintained. We ended up having to conduct research in 21 different sets of archives in six different countries. Data was collected based on the categories of individual and communal losses as follows. Under the individual category, there were immovable assets like urban and rural land, buildings, houses. There were movable assets like household and personal items, including furniture, and financial assets like bank accounts, pensions, and other securities. Under the business category, losses included business values, inventories, real estate, and commercial holdings. Under the communal category, land and property owned by Jewish communities, including synagogues, schools, cemeteries, mikvahs, and in some cases, even hospitals and community centers. Every attempt was made to produce credible, documented financial projections that can withhold critical scrutiny. Because we are aware that soon to be released reports detailing such extensive losses can turn into a controversial, sensitive matter, and it must be dealt with extremely judiciously. Efforts can and will be made to ensure that the report's release does not adversely affect Israel's current and growing relations with a number of important Arab allies, as there are reports on countries like Egypt and Morocco. We must refute the canard that our adversaries will no doubt allege that here come the Jews again, once more, just like the Holocaust, all they're interested in is money, compensation. What we must underscore is that these reports are not just about money, nor claims for compensation. The reports reveal that not everyone lost everything. In some instances, Jews were able to take out their assets, like Lebanon, or compensation regimes were established for lost assets between Algeria and France, between the UK and Egypt, or in countries like Morocco, where some Jews still maintain financial holdings. So consequently, there are a number of country reports that will have no financial figures on losses at all, only the narrative of once thriving Jewish communities that are no longer. The country reports are divided up into four sections. One, the historical overview of thousands of years of Jewish cultural heritage in that country. Two, the role in society played by Jewish minorities and their contributions to the Arab countries in which they lived. Three, the mass violations of human rights, displacement and resettlement. And lastly, the valuations for losses of individual and communal assets. Now while these reports will follow a standard methodology, for gathering data, each report is personalized, as not all countries were alike in the manner in which they treated their Jews. By way of example, leading Arab countries took many forms. In e Egypt, there were edicts of expulsion. In Iraq, there was an organized population transfer. In Libya, Jews fled for their lives. While in others countries, Jews were held hostage, forbidden to leave, like in Syria. So in light of these differences, each report was individually produced to provide a context to tell the story of a distinctive history, about a unique heritage, about suffering and displacement, as well as personal financial losses. The process of calculating all these country losses is still ongoing. The release of these 11 country reports will take place during the course of 2023. In closing, may I say that perhaps in my naivete, Seeking a just solution for all Middle East refugees may still be possible. There are models for compensation that have been discussed over many years to provide rights and redress for both Arab and Jewish refugees. Central to them all is the need to establish an international Middle East peace fund, as alluded to earlier, first proposed by President Clinton in the year 2000 and discussed in subsequent 
Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Now, some would say that it is illogical to assume that such an international fund could be established with a mandate to provide compensation to both sides involved in the same conflict. People said it's never been done. In fact, it has. In 1991, the United Nations established just such a precedent for the victims of the first Gulf War, a UN-administered compensation commission that provided compensation to all victims of the Scuds attacks on both sides, including individuals in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. In the spirit of the Abraham Accords, now is the time for renewing this call for an international Middle East Peace Fund, a modern day Marshall Plan, not only for the benefit of Middle East refugees, but also to provide financial relief for all states in the regions who were burdened by the transfer of populations, including Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, as well as Israel. These states under this plan would receive restitution for hosting refugees for so many years. These funds could be used to build new infrastructures and provide services, roads, sewers, schools, hospitals, and be a transformative initiative for the entire Middle East. At a time of historic breakthroughs in political and financial times between Muslim countries and Jews in Israel, such a modern day Marshall Plan could have a, the potential to transform the Middle East and promote reconciliation among all peoples in the regions. It is certainly something to aspire to and work toward. Thank you very much.